In chapter 6 of Leviathan, Hobbes appears to be going off into a different direction. He's talking about what we would nowadays typically associate with psychology and say, well, that's really got nothing to do with any of the other things that he's, he's focused on, with you know, political science or with epistemology or, or ne even necessarily with metaphysics. Psychology is about the, the emotions of the human being, their feelings, what he's calling the passions, their fundamental motivations. Remember, though, that psychology is a discipline that originally emerged from philosophy, and at the time that Hobbes is writing, it's not yet an independent discipline. That's going to happen several centuries later. So Hobbes, as a good philosopher trying to make sense of the entire human being, and really of, of the world as much as he can, is going to be doing some psychology. Now he's talking about voluntary emotions, and we'll get to why he's calling them voluntary in a moment. I want to focus here on this, this notion of the passions. Hobbes is, like many of his other contemporaries, in trying to figure out how our emotional life, our affective life, our motivations really work, in part because there often tends to be, as we see this early on even with Plato, uh, a dissonance between what our emotions or our appetites or our desires are telling us to do and what reason or rationality or prudence is telling us to do. And Hobbes is not going to talk about the passions of the soul because he doesn't actually believe in anything like a soul, but he is going to talk about the human mind. The human mind is just as much a matter of passions as it is of thoughts. As a matter of fact, you might say that passions are a kind of thought, just as much as about sense issues, just as much about reasoning. This really is what drives us. This is what gets us moving. This is what brings us to do things. And this is what motivates much, much of our reasoning. So we really want to have a good sense about what's going on with this. He has this term called endeavor, and endeavor um, he views as something physical. As a matter of fact, all these things are ultimately going to be physical. So he says in animals there's two sorts of motions peculiar to them, one called vital, which is begun during generation and continued without interruption throughout their whole life, like you know, circulation of the blood, breathing, um, you know, nutrition, excretion, all those sorts of things that we don't really see as voluntary. They just happen, right? They're physical processes. But they're physical processes that living tissues have to have in order to remain living tissues. Others are voluntary motions. And he gives examples like to go, to speak, to move any of our limbs in such manner as is first fancied in our minds. So our, you might say, our conscious life, our life that has to do with what we choose on some level to do is going to be motivated by what he calls endeavor. So endeavor is the broadest designation for this, this emotional or affective dimension of human life. He says, um, you know, although unstudied men do not conceive any motion at all to be there when the thing moved is invisible, um, that does not hinder but that such motions are. And there are small beginnings of motion within the body of a human being before they appear in walking, speaking, striking, and all the other visible actions. And this he calls endeavor. So this is the beginning of our, our conscious actions, like moving a hand, or approaching the camera, or you know, putting chalk up to my cheek, or any of those sorts of things. Taking my glasses off, taking my, putting my glasses back on, taking them off again. All of those are voluntary actions but they begin with endeavor. And endeavor comes, you might say, in two main flavors, or if you like, polarities. And here you're going to see that Hobbes is saying things very similar to some other thinkers that we've looked at in the past. There's appetite or desire, and that's motion towards something. I want to write on the chalkboard. I'm drawn towards the chalkboard. I'm attracted to it. Right? I turn my body towards it. I focus my attention on it. You actually want to hear what I have to say? Um, you don't mute the, the volume. <laughs> you, you listen to what I'm saying. You put your headphones on so that you can get rid of the other distractions. You're watching the board. Now, that's motion towards, right? Appetite or desire. Then there's motion away from. This is the opposite of desire, what he calls aversion. 
And, you know, this is a common term for that. So we have a, a push and we have a pull, you might say. We have a positive and we have a, a negative. Um, motion away from things is aversion. When we are averse to something, we don't want that thing. So he says, this endeavor, when it's towards something which causes it, is called the appetite or desire. This latter being the general name and often uh, times restrained to signify the desire of, of food, namely hunger and thirst. When endeavor is fromward something, that's a beautiful English word that he's using, fromward is generally called aversion. He says we got these from the Latins, they had other words from the Greeks, doesn't matter what we call them. We can call them, you know, fort and da, you know, in the, the old German Freudian thing, or we can say being drawn towards or being repelled by. We have a whole vocabulary for this sort of thing. The main thing to understand is that these are basic human drives. These are basic human uh, experiences. And they're going on all the time within every human being. How do we get to this other stuff? So we have appetite or desire. We have aversion. He says, that which men desire, they are also said to love. Love the feeling that we feel, in its very broad sense, he doesn't mean romantic love, he doesn't mean, you know, mother love or something like that. He means this very encompassing thing. And hate, um, hate doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, like hating somebody's guts terribly. You can say, I hate chocolate. That would be a strange thing to say, but there are some people who do, right? Um, or I love chocolate. Those are, those are things that we can say. And he points out that, how can we distinguish these? Love and hate are really expressions of aversion and desire. But when we talk about having desire for something, what we mean is uh, we're talking about something in its absence or when we don't yet have it, right? And when we feel an aversion towards something, Again, um, you know, it may not be totally absent, but because it is pushing us away, but it is not quite yet there. And then when it's there, we hate it. I hate when it rains on me when I'm wearing my my uh, corduroy because my corduroy gets wet and it doesn't dry out for a long time. You know, we say things like this in our ordinary life. Oh, I hate that guy. Why does he have to ride the same bus as me? He's always playing his music so, so loud. You're averse to that. Before he gets on the bus, as he's walking on the bus, you're like, oh, man, that guy again. Oh, you're averse to him. And then when he's sitting next to you, Hobbes would say, well, you hate him. You know, um, somebody else gets on the bus, the guy who always brings cotton candy on, and he, he always brings enough for everybody. Oh, you love that guy, right? You see him walking down the street, and you're like, I hope he catches the bus. Oh, good, he's on. Now, now you, you, know, you feel that sense of love towards him. And when you're imagining him as present, you feel love. And when you're imagining the other guy as present, you feel, you feel hatred towards him. These are feelings that we feel. Um, we can also talk about... Another sort of example or expression of, of this, this polarity, things that we love, things that we feel desire for, when we're actually enjoying them, we feel what Hobbes calls delight or, or pleasure, you know? If, if, you know, writing on the chalkboard is what I really get into, oh man, this is so good, yeah, I'm feeling pleasure now, I'm feeling, you know, uh, delight. I'm not really, because, you know what I actually, well, I'll tell you what I feel towards chalk in a moment. It's not, it's not displeasure, by the way. Um, Hobbes also says, too, when we're talking about mental pleasure, we, we talk about joy. So, you know, I've used the dating example in, in one of the other videos. Remember when you go on your first date with somebody who you're really attracted to, and, it, you know, holy, you know, whatever you want to say, they're attracted to you too. Remember how wonderful that feels? That's not just a physical pleasure in the sense of, you know, you know, your, your body feeling a certain way. You might actually feel, your body might be feeling, you know, that, that you might be throwing up the next moment because you have those butterflies in your stomach. But psychologically, you feel a sense of, of well-being, of happiness, of joy. That's that. Now, you know, on the other side, Things that we are averse to, things that we hate, when, we have, when we're stuck with them, we feel displeasure or we feel pain. 
That guy gets on the bus with his stupid music that's just thumping the whole time. I wish he would shut up and get out of here. By the way, he also stinks. You know, it'd be nice if the guy took a shower once in a while. Uh, you know, we can go on and on and on. Those are modes of displeasure. Um, you know, it, it can be stretching it a little bit to talk about pain because, um, you know, we typically associate pain with like a you know, physical pain. Um, but in the broad sense, pain is anything that, that bothers us. When we're thinking about mental things, we can talk about grief. You know, the, the uh, deprivation of things that we, um, we really care about. You know, when somebody dies, for example, why do we feel grief? Because a good, something that we actually delighted in, something that we loved, something that we wanted, has been taken away. And we're averse to that. You know, sometimes you can take these uh, and flip them around. Now, I mentioned that I would say something else about chalk. And I'm not going to talk about chalk per se. What I'm going to say is, you know, when it comes down to it, you can say, Dr. Sandler, how do you feel about chalk? Do you have an appetite towards it, or do you have an aversion to it? Do you love it, or do you hate it? You know, does it give you joy to contemplate chalk, or does it, on the other hand, give you grief? And I can say, and we have a great word for it these days, meh. Now, what is that, as we, as we write it these days, meh? Well, that's what Hobbes calls... Contempt. And contempt goes along with love and hate. We don't always love or hate things. He says, um, those things which we neither desire nor hate were said to contemn. Contempt being nothing else but an immobility or contumacy of the heart in resisting the action of certain things and proceeding from the, that the heart is already moved otherwise by more potent objects or from want of experience with them. So, you know, why don't I care about chalk? I suppose if chalk was the only thing in the world, maybe I would feel love or hate towards it, but it's pretty low on, on the level of, you know, things that matter to me. Now, if you, if you take the chalk, and I'm not going to do this because you know, it really creeps me out when people do the chalk, you know, the, the, the scraping sound on the chalkboard. I don't like that. That I actually feel displeasure about. But chalk in general, I feel contempt about. I, I don't really care about it one way or the other. This is going to assume a very important role in some of the other emotions and in human relations um, as we move into some of the other chapters. So um, Hobbes goes on and, and he says that you know this motion um, that we that's called appetite seems to be a corroboration of vital motion and a help thereunto. Such things that are called the light, you know, are, have, have certain names and we have, we have pleasure with them. And then he goes on and he says, these simple passions called appetite, desire, love, aversion, hate, joy, grief, and also, he should have added in there, contempt, have their names for diverse considerations, diversified. Now, what does that mean? I have to do a little bit of a racer here. Um, for diverse considerations, diversified. It's a wonderful line, isn't it? What he's saying there is that these basic emotions, um, and I understand that if some of you are in psychology, you may say he's left out some, some basic emotions because you're working with a, a different uh, set of them that we use in uh, other psychological theories. But you've got to go with Hobbes a little bit on this just to, to see where he's, he's actually heading, he is going to say, that doesn't race very well, does it? He is going to say that we can take these and basic emotions or passions, and we can do four things with them. The first is that um, we can, we can modify them in terms of the, what he calls the opinion of likelihood, likelihood of achieving something. Now, why does that matter? Well, 
when we're feeling desire for something, we want to achieve something. We want to get something. We want to enjoy something. When we're feeling aversion, we want something not to be there. We want to get away from it. We want to escape it. And we can focus on how likely, how probable it is that we're going to get what we want or not get what we don't want. But it matters not just what the actual likelihood is, but what we take that likelihood to be. So some of the early examples that he gives. Um, appetite with an opinion of attaining is called hope. When we feel hope, we are feeling desire towards something, and at the same time, we have a positive opinion of the likelihood of getting it. Because when we don't have that, when we have an appetite for something, um, but we don't have that opinion, we think we're not going to get it, we feel despair. So you see, other emotions can be produced by changing this variable here. He goes on and he says, aversion with opinion of hurt from the object, if you think you're going to actually get it hurt by it, fear. The same with the hope of avoiding that hurt by resistance, courage. So we can, we can bring up all sorts of new considerations that produce additional passions. Going down this road is going to gradually reveal to us all these different emotions that the human being can feel. What's another way that we can produce uh, a new emotion? He says, um, from the object that is loved or hated. Or you can even say felt contempt towards. So he's got some examples here. Um, desire of good to another is benevolence, feeling, you know, goodwill towards another person. If to man generally, good nature. Desire of riches, covetousness or greed. Um, desire of office or precedence, ambition. These are, you might say, emotions or drives or Hobbes is going to use this word passions and they depend on the object. Now it doesn't just have to be love or hate because contempt can also fit in there as well. Contempt of little helps and hindrances is what he calls magnanimity, and magnanimity in danger of death or wounds is what we call valor or fortitude. Magnanimity in the use of riches, liberality. Um, we can go on and on and on. You, you see that we can derive a number of different passions, a number of different emotions, a number of different drives by changing the object that love or hate or contempt applies to. And then we can compound it even further. We can go on. There's another way. He says, um, consideration of the passions together. We can uh, combine them. So, um, you know, one example of this would be love. He says, love of one singularly with desire to be singularly beloved. So there we're talking about the object, right? The passion of love. The same with fear that the love is not mutual. Jealousy. What is jealousy? <clears throat> it's actually a combination of two different emotions coming together. Love and a particular kind of fear. That's what produces jealousy. So some emotions are actually going to be composite. They're going to be more complex. They're going to be combinations of others. Um, let me see if I have some, some other ones here. Um, for example... Um, Grief for the calamity of another is pity, and ariseth from the imagination that the like calamity may befall himself, and therefore is also called compassion. So, you know, you see somebody else suffering something, 
and you feel bad about that because you're averse to it, and at the same time you fear that that can happen to you because they're similar to you, that's what pity or compassion is. So that's a composite emotion as well. And then uh, we finally have one other um, one, which is uh, one other possibility, which is the alteration or succession. When one emotion, one passion, one drive changes into another, or one follows another, um, what would what would be some examples of that in, in these that he gives? He's got this sudden glory and sudden dejection. Those are cases where something has changed uh, very quickly. And those cause laughing and, and crying, right? He says, sudden dejection is caused by accidents that suddenly take away some, some hope or prop of their power. Um, so, you know, at first we're feeling confident, we're feeling hopeful about getting what it is that we want. And then somebody comes along and says, nope, you're not getting it. And then we, we feel bad and now we cry. That's an example of another complex emotion. So, sudden dejection, the kind of thing that makes us cry. Laughter is, is another example of that as well for Hobbes. Um, you notice that he's got a whole bunch of different examples here. I mean, we could run down the, the whole list here of, of uh, things. He, he has um, despair, fear, courage, anger, hope. Uh, confidence, diffidence, um, benevolence, covetousness, ambition, uh, cowardice or pusillanimity, magnanimity, fortitude, liberality, wretchedness, uh, kindness, natural lust, luxury, uh, the passion of love, jealousy, um, revengefulness, curiosity. We can just keep going on and on and on. Hobbes is trying to, from this basis, of you know certain emotions and these ways of combining them together or modifying them get us the entire range of human emotional and affective life. He's trying to provide us with a mechanistic account of that. There's one other thing that we do need to discuss in this part that we didn't get to. Now we want to focus on the part about the voluntary. So what does it mean for something to be voluntary? Oftentimes we'll say something is voluntary when we indeed chose it. So my erasing this chalkboard is a voluntary motion because I am choosing to erase it. Other times we'll talk about the voluntary as encompassing even things that we didn't do, but we could have done because we were responsible for it. Hobbes is going to go a little bit further than that. He is willing to say that um, what we do as human beings is we have all these passions, right? And these passions are this complicated interaction and they're sometimes going in different directions, um, but they ultimately lead us to something. Whatever, you know, we add them up. Maybe you feel anger and fear at the same time. You know, like when, when somebody insults you and you think, I should, you know, I should go take revenge on that person, I should say something in response, but you're also afraid of what might happen. You have several different passions that are, that are fighting within you. And you might engage in deliberation. You might actually ask yourself, well, should I do this or should I do that? You might think to yourself about that. Hobbes talks about that. He says, um, when in the mind of man appetites and aversions, hopes and fears concerning one and the same thing arise alternately and diverse good and evil consequences of the doing or emitting of the thing propounded come successively in our thoughts. So sometimes we have an appetite to it, sometimes an aversion, sometimes hope to be able to do it, sometimes despair or fear to attempt it. The whole sum of desires, aversions, hopes and fears continue till the thing be either done or thought impossible. That's what we call deliberation. So deliberation is the sum 
of the passions that we feel about something. And then we eventually come to the point where we say, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do it. Or maybe I'll wait until later and then decide, right? So he says, um, this happens with, with human beings and this also happens with animals. Um, deliberation ends when that whereof they deliberate is either done or thought impossible. Until then, we're free to decide to do it or not to do it, even though we're being motivated by our passions. And then we arrive at a point where we either act or don't act. If we think it's possible and we want to do something, we do it. If we think it's impossible, then we, we don't do it. So he says, in deliberation, the last appetite or aversion immediately adhering to the action is that which we call the will. We get the word voluntary from the Latin word for will, voluntas. Voluntary action concerns the will, but the will for Hobbes is essentially just the product of all these passions, all these drives, all these being pushed and pulled and drawn and repulsed in all these different modalities. That's what the will is. He th says it doesn't even, you don't even really need to think about freedom of the will or anything like that. You're free until you actually decide. And then, of course, you've decided, so it doesn't matter. But so long as there's sort of a play of the appetites or desires or aversions with each other, you are free. You are responsible. It's your will. So the passions produce voluntary motions. As a matter of fact, in a certain way, even the passions themselves can be, to some extent, voluntary motions. Do you have any, any uh, responsibility in how angry you get or how sad you get or you know, whether you desire things too much? Do you have any role in being able to change that? Hobbes would say that that makes it voluntary. So what we've got here, sort of to sum up, is a picture of the human being as, again, still a machine, but now driven by all these different desires and aversions that are part of our nature or that we learn over time um, and they produce or keep us from producing our actions. Deliberation and the will fit into this, but they're largely a product and a sum of our passions.